Now constants we've seen work like names to pick out objects. Predicates pick out concepts which apply to those objects. Let's look at predicates now. Predicates are used to affirm something of something. So for instance, we have a predicate like tall, which we write with a capital letter, and we can plunk in a constant, say A, and this just tells us that A is tall. The special term for this item here that goes into the empty space of a predicate is argument. This is a technical term and it sometimes strikes people as kind of strange. It doesn't really have anything to do with arguing or presenting an argument or anything like that, but that's the term that is traditionally used for this. Now predicates can come with one blank space to take an argument or two blank spaces or as many blank spaces as you like. For example, tall takes only one blank space, but taller we might spell this out as taller than, clearly has to be said about two objects, and so it has two blank spaces. For instance, we can say that A is tall and that A is taller than B. We can extend these sorts of things to three. So for instance, between can only be said concerning three objects, that something is between two other things. So we can say, for instance, that A is between B and C. The name for this first kind of predicate, which takes only one argument, is unary. The second type, which takes two, is called a binary predicate. And the third type is called a ternary predicate. And we could just keep going as long as we wanted to, creating more and more complex predicates. There's absolutely no in-principle limit on how many arguments these can take. Although, of course, they get quite unwieldy. For example, consider a predicate like gave with four argument spaces, where you'd fill it out by saying something like A gave money to B at time T. So here we'd have a quaternary predicate. Now there's a technical term for all these aries, and that's just arity. So we speak of, for instance, tall having arity 1, taller than having arity 2, between having arity 3, gave arity 4, and so on for any complex predicates we wish to construct. Arity, then, is just a general term that covers all these things, and it's the second technical term after argument. Now, gave is an interesting example, and I want to have a look at this because there are many ways of cashing out gave, at least in a natural language like English. For instance, we could just say that A gave money, or we could say A gave money to B without specifying the time. So we can cash this out as a binary predicate, a ternary predicate, a quaternary predicate, but it's crucial to bear in mind that these are not equivalent. These differ in arity, and they are by no means the same predicate. So A gave money has arity 2, A gave money to B has arity 3, and A gave money to B at time t up here has arity 4. So these are not the same predicate, they don't express the same thing, even though they all look like the ambiguous English term gave. That's the first point. The second point is that every predicate either applies or doesn't apply to everything in question. So let's just take a famous and philosophically problematic example, heap. And this will just say that A is a heap. We can have our A here. One famous puzzle in the history of philosophy is called the Sorites Paradox. The paradox is, suppose you start removing grains from your heap. At what point does it stop being a heap? That is to say, at what point does heap go from applying to A to no longer applying to A? This is an interesting philosophical question, but in classical logic of the sort that we're studying, we just completely banish paradoxes of this sort. So there's no sorites paradox. For everything, it'll be true or false that heap applies to it. Now, this might strike you as odd, and if so, you're not alone. In fact, it struck many people as odd. And there's an alternative system to the classical logic which we're studying, which deals in these vague predicates, which is called fuzzy logic. It has a huge variety of applications and has received a lot of attention recently. I plan to make an optional video about the basic idea of fuzzy logic later on. But for now, the point just is that if it strikes you as a bit odd that the predicate term heap either applies or doesn't apply to everything in the domain, then you're certainly not alone, and it's not a sign that you're not understanding logic, it's just not how this system works. So, that's our rule. There is no ambiguity. And the problem posed by the Sorites paradox goes out the window. One final fact I want to have a look at is that you can say the same thing, or at least something with the same truth conditions, even though the predicates are quite different. So you can express the same thing differently. Take the predicate left of and say that A is left of B. Well, you can also express this using the predicate right of and reversing the order of the arguments, that is to say the constants. So B is right of A says the same thing as A is left of B. 
And these sorts of equivalences are important to keep in mind as we work along through the course and especially for the assignments. So in sum then, predicates have arity, which is the number of arguments they take. Argument again being a technical term and not the kind of argument we typically mean when we talk about arguments in logic and so forth. Second, predicates with different arity like this cannot be the same even if they seem to correspond to the same ambiguous English turn of phrase the way gave did in our example. Third, there are no ambiguous predicates. Heap either applies or doesn't apply to every object. And finally, equivalent things can be expressed using different predicates and different orders of the constants and so forth. 